Well, good morning, church. How we doing? Are you ready to worship? Let's bring in the new year really strong. We are glad to see you here in person. Worship this morning. Whoa, oh, oh, we shout out your praise. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison door. He parted the before you with glad thanksgiving father father we are grateful for another year that we get to know you we get to worship you we get to follow and walk with you 
In Hebrews chapter 10, we read, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Father God, we want to draw near to you this morning. And God, that's why we gather. We want to stir one another up to faith and good works. We want to worship you, Jesus, as one voice, as your people. We want to express our love to you in every way possible, Jesus. And right now, we bring a song. God, I pray that what we do here would just be an outpouring of a life spent as a love note to you. Jesus, we worship you and we love you. Would you receive our praise this morning? found here in our sacred space I hear a voice to see your face say that again now I'm returning to the secret place just an altar in the flame love is found here our sacred space, I hear your voice, I see your face.
You're still my first love. We love you. That we love because you first loved. Lord, you are so good in all of your ways. Lord, and you are deserving of all the glory, all the honor. Be lifted up in this place. Be lifted up in our lives in this year to come, Father and everything it holds, no matter what we go through, Lord. All honor and glory to you. You're so good. Thank you, Jesus.
There's nothing like you, Lord. Lord, there's none that compare to you, to your beauty, beautiful name, Father, to your glory. Be enthroned upon our praises this morning. Lord, these aren't just lyrics, Lord. And let us not just see it as that, but let us see it as a song that we're declaring to you, that you are our first love. You are worthy of it all. Lord, without us worshiping you, Father, this is just noise and music. But Lord, because of you, it's able to be targeted and say, Lord, we love you. You are our first love. You are the reason why we sing. You're the reason why we lift our hands and our voice. It's all because of you, Father. We love you. Be glorified in this place today. In your holy and precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Well, good morning. It's our first time being back. It's good to see all of you. Before we move on in service, why don't you turn and greet one another this morning? Well, Happy New Year, everybody. That's it. That's, a, that's the only excitement we got. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are really, really excited for 2023 and all that the Lord has um, for us as a congregation, what he wants to do. Yeah, that's all right. You can get excited. 
I wanted, we have a news video to tell you a few things coming up, but before we did, I did want to highlight one special thing that we're doing as a church family on January 29th, Celebration Sunday. And what we consider Celebration Sunday is we're celebrating baptism. We're celebrating life change. Um, and baptism is what we do as Christ followers to tell everyone around us that the old us is now gone. We have surrendered and we are being raised to life in Christ as a new creation. And so baptism is a really, really important, exciting and special thing that we love celebrating as a church family. So if you um, have a child, if you yourself um, have committed your life to Christ, maybe for the first or maybe even again as an adult um, of recommitment, anything like that, and you would like to signify to your friends, your family and your church um, body that you are a new creation in Christ. We would encourage you to participate in baptism. We would love to celebrate that with you as your church family. So you could sign up online at reallife.org or you can go to our app um, and sign up there. We do have a baptism class that happens um, the week before. We have one for kids happening and then we want have one for youth and adults. You can get all the dates, information for that at reallife.org. But we would love to celebrate with you in baptism. Um, and plan to be here. That's going to be a really awesome Sunday to celebrate as families. So do not miss it. All right. Now, without any further ado, the video, guys. <laughs> here at River City is to see more people living real life by passionately following Jesus. And we are so excited to carry that mission into 2023. To kick off this brand new year, we will be starting a brand new series entitled Gospel in the Throughout this series, we will look at the biblical instruction and application of living a life transformed by the gospel. This will be a formative series for our church family this year, so you do not want to miss it. Do not miss it. It's going to be awesome. In the next couple of weeks, we will also be Discover class. This class happens weekly during our 1130 service and it is for anyone looking for the next steps in your pursuit. If you haven't yet, we encourage you to get in there, attend the 930 service, and then come to this class. Just one week and you will be well on your way to join the family here in your city. Well, I do believe that's all we have for you. So until next time, have a wonderful day and a happy new year. How's it going, everyone? Again, one more time, Happy New Year. Yeah, see, thank you for responding to me better than Lauren. Lauren, you just didn't say it right, okay? How many of you enjoyed that New Year's uh, service we put out for you last week? Okay, the fact that there's only a few of you laughing, the rest of you didn't even look. Okay, so I'm not the only one on this. Oh, that was so humiliating. You should if New Year's wasn't fun for us. We had this great service, and it's up now. You can go see it. Great, it's, you know, it, it's a few days, no big deal. What I love most is as they were putting out announcements about our failure. It was a file that just got messed up, and so we had to redo a bunch of stuff there on New Year's morning. 
So they put the announcement out, and what they do is they put a picture of me. Oh, we're sorry, we failed. It'll be coming soon. I'm like, thank you. Thank you for putting. Thank you for having my face hanging out, which I guess is what happened. But thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. She said we still love you, and she's the only one who said it. That's what's interesting. I find that find that compelling. No, check that out. Uh, we talked a lot about just kind of how to process the year and. Uh, you know, I think this is a significant time. I love what God does at New Year. So, Happy New Year. I hope you, uh, you experienced an amazing Christmas and New Year celebration. I hope you just got a chance to chill a little bit with family and friends and reflect on the goodness of God. Because I think that's what holidays should be. They should be reflecting on the goodness of God and celebrating and enjoying Him with those that we love. Uh, before we get into the message this morning, I want to let you know, next uh, Sunday, January 15th at 2 p.m., 2 p.m., we're going to have an info meeting for an Israel trip that we are doing. We're going to be going to Israel in February of 2024. This is a little more, we, we kind of got people some, some general information before, just quick after service, kind of touch base. A bunch of people signed up. You've probably received an email. If you haven't, show up at that meeting, and you will get much more information. You'll get to see kind of some of the sites we may be going to and things like that. But it's kind of time to start saying, okay, yeah, we're going to go, not just, I want more info, Okay. So that's what this, this meeting is about, getting the info you need, asking questions. Maybe there's questions that we don't even have the answers of, but you have the questions, so we'll get that. But in the next couple months, we're going to have to say, yeah, we're going to go, we're going to sign up. It's a life-changing trip. But if you want to know more about that and you'd li like to go with us, River City, um, January 15th in the cantina, next Sunday, 2 p.m., so you can you know, go get lunch and then come back and uh, probably do an hour, hour 15 meeting. Okay, so... Uh, plan to be a part of that. It's going to be a great trip, and that'll help you get prepared for that. As you were told on the news, and as we said before we left for Christmas, um, we're beginning a new series today called Gospel People. I say we're beginning a new series because this series is ultimately going to be a study of the book of Colossians. We're going to walk through and see what the Lord said through the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians regarding living the gospel. It's a fantastic book fantastic truth. Um, I'm calling this week kind of a preface. I was planning on starting Colossians, but one of the things I do every year at this time of year, end of the year, early in the year, is I ask the Lord kind of just to talk to me about, I, I'm always asking the Lord to speak, always asking to move, but it's like, Lord, this is a pause. I try to take a pause and say, how are we doing? How are we doing? And I look back, try to evaluate, look forward, Try to say, God, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to be preparing for? Just in a quiet time when there's not as much hammering on me. And the Lord really spoke to me out of John chapter 15. In fact, John chapter, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. That's what we're going to park this morning. You could probably preach on this passage every New Year's and do really well, okay, by your congregation. We could study this passage. It's one of those unique kind of, defining passages. Because whenever you come to times like New Year's and things like that, you, you have to ask the question, how do we evaluate? How do we evaluate our days? It was a good day. You know, my wife gets ticked off. How was your day? Good. It's good. That's it. You're gone all day, and that's what I get. Good. It's a fine day. It was fine. I, it was a fine day. You, see, I, I, you know, it's, it's like, that, that's not a great evaluation of a day. How do we evaluate our months, our years? Compared to what? What are we looking at? You know, in a world where people, even people in our own families, people in our neighborhoods, people we work with, are so completely divided as to what matters, what's right, what's wrong. How do we evaluate? You know, I can tell you last year was a busy year. But what was accomplished? You could probably tell me last year was a busy year, but it's worth asking, what was accomplished? What's going to last? Did, was, I, was God able to use me to change the world in any way? Maybe alter the future or impact eternity? All those questions. This passage of Scripture, John 15, I think is an incredible um, description of the nature of our existence that gives us a clue as to how we look at the big picture. 
How are we looking at the big picture? It's one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture, the way Jesus describes this incredible truth. It's so clear, easy to understand, and yet almost poetic in the way that he shares it. Listen to what Jesus says. John 15, beginning at verse 1, he says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to me, and thank you for speaking to us from this passage of Scripture. I ask that we would just pause in this Sunday morning together and hear your voice. We thank you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, help us to hear you, and then help us to walk in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled the message of fruitful life, a fruitful life, because if you read that, you can say, okay, I guess fruit's a big deal. Fruit is a big deal. He wants us to bear fruit. Now, he starts by talking about, he says, I am the true vine. In scripture, there's three different ways that the vine is used as, pretty, as, as kind of an illustration. In the past, Israel is called the vine or the vineyard multiple times. In Psalm 80, you see a vine that's been transplanted from Egypt. In Isaiah 5, We're told of a song for the vineyard. And what more could I have done for my vineyard, says the Lord. Ezekiel 19, he refers to his people as the vine. Hosea 10.1, Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. Matthew 21.33, remember Jesus is talking about the parable of the tenants. He talks about the, the servants who killed the servants and ultimately the son of the owner of the vineyard. He saw his people as his vineyard this would have meant something to his listeners when he's talking about i'm the vine my father's the fine dresser they would have remembered these illustrations of them israel god's people as his vine his vineyard future is depicted as a vine revelation 14 18 19 says put in your sickle gather the clusters from the vines of the earth for its grapes are ripe so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grapes grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine presses of the wrath of God. That's where we get the phrase, the grapes of wrath, from the Battle Hymn of the Republic, as well as, of course, Steinbeck's award-winning novel, Grapes of Wrath. So you see the future aspect of vine, the past picture of vine. But Jesus, right here in the present, is saying, I am the vine. Okay, this is the ultimate. This is it. I am the vine, the present vine the original. And then he says, we are the branches. And he gives all the obvious implications. The vine nourishes the branches, allows them to produce grapes. A branch separated from the vine is dead, even if it still looks alive. Even if it still looks alive, it's dead. And it will never bear fruit, and it will slowly wither. And that's what he's doing. He's he's giving this picture we all understand you, you trim a tree, you got a, bunch of, you got a bunch of green branches there for a while. Wait a few days. And he issues this kind of as a warning. Be careful. He talks about the father as the vine dresser or the gardener. And this picture of the father caring, pruning, or purging if necessary. And one of the things that you could just a side note, caring involves cutting. Caring involves cutting whether it's purging or pruning. 
It's not fun. But the Father loves us enough to prune those things in our spirit, in our character, in our nature that are not fruitful and will not bear fruit. Prayer is, Lord, help me to bear fruit. fruit. Well, if you mean that, prepare for some trimming, some cutting. And then, of course, the main instruction of this section, the call to abide. And what's fascinating is when you think about branches and the vine, branches don't have to be told to abide, right? It's all they can do. It just is. You know, you don't have to keep putting the branches back on because they separate from the vine. I'm saying you get back on it, right? But see, we're branches that have a free will. That's why Jesus is saying to us, you must abide. And see, what I'm trying to get us to look at as we look at this passage is this is a physical picture of a spiritual reality. Physically, we understand it as reality. Sometimes I think spiritually we're not so sure. Just because it's spiritual doesn't mean it's not real. This is real. Vines are supposed to bear fruit. There is no such thing as a fruitful branch that is separated from the vine. And here's something that is every bit as true, and I want every one of us to jot this down, make note of this. This is what the Lord was saying to me, and this is what I want to share with you. There's no such thing as a fruitful life without abiding in the presence of Jesus. If there's no such thing as a fruitful branch that's separated from the vine, which you would go, yep, that's true, that's just law of nature, it's just real, we've all seen it. It is every bit as true according to Jesus Christ, there's no such thing as a fruitful life without abiding in the presence of Jesus. That's just true. There's no such thing as a fruitful life without abiding in his presence. Oh, people can fake it. We can fake it. There's all kinds of things that we can say and look busy and say, oh, I'm being really fruitful. But the fact of the matter is there's no such thing as a fruitful life apart from abiding in Jesus. That's what he's saying. This is one of those things he said on the night before he was betrayed. The night he was betrayed before he, he would be tried and crucified. One of the few things he told his followers is this, you must abide in me or you'll never be able to bear fruit. You must abide in me, live in me. Maybe you have the NIV translation. You notice they use the word remain in me. Both are an excellent translation of the word, of the Greek word. You must abide in me or you cannot bear fruit. Let's talk a little bit about fruit. Let me make a couple of observations from this. Number one, fruit is a supernatural work of God. I want you to understand this. That's what fruit is. Fruit, as Jesus is talking about, it is a supernatural work from God. There's lots of things we can do our, on our own, right? Lots of things we can do on our own. We can, we can work hard, and we can get a nice home. We can work hard, and we get a nice car, can't we? a big business, we can get success, we can get a bank account that's full, all kinds of things that we can go do, but I want to be crystal clear, those are not fruit. Fruit is supernatural. Fruit is a work of God in the life of the believer. That's what fruit is. We can have lots of friends and even have a happy family, and it may not necessarily be fruit. Even ministries. This is one of those things that have been really challenging in the church. And every time it crops up and it gets public, a church that seemed to be doing so much good work, and then you find out there was a rot at the core, and all this hurt, and all this sin that was at the core of it. But what about all the good fruit? What about all, all that good fruit? I'm not saying that God can't bear fruit in spite of some of those things, but the things that that church said, look, look at all the fruit, to evidence. We've got to be careful. Things that our church could say. Oh, look at all the fruit. Let's make sure it's actually fruit. And the core understanding of fruit is it is supernatural. Fruit is supernatural. How do you know spiritual fruit? Only Jesus can produce fruit. Only Jesus. We can bear fruit, but only he can produce fruit. We can bear fruit, but only he can produce fruit. We're the branch. He's the vine. Jesus made a statement. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I kind of, that, that was something that I kind of hung on when I was looking at this passage for the last couple of weeks. I just kept hanging on to this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm like, well, Lord, there's lots of things I can do apart from you. And of course, I'm, I'm not sitting here correcting Jesus, okay? Don't get me wrong. 
I, without him, I can't breathe. I don't have breath. I don't have life. So uh, in the empirical sense, yes, of course, right? But there's all kinds of things I can do apart from Jesus. I can sin apart from Jesus. I can be hurtful to people. I can serve my own self-interest apart from Jesus. I can do lots of things apart from Jesus. Let me tell you what he's saying. Remember that statement is in the context of fruit. He talks about bearing fruit. He talks about all these good things about fruit. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I want to just kind of, for, for editorial sake, I want us to understand, apart from me, you can do nothing fruitful. Apart from me, you can do nothing fruitful. You can do all kinds of stuff. We can be busy. And that's, what, that's one of the things that God was kind of challenging me with. Don't just be busy kind of for the kingdom. Don't just be busy. I want you to bear fruit. I don't want you to just do stuff. Because the truth is, apart from me, you can do nothing fruitful. You can't. You can't produce anything. And this is something I think we got to get a handle on. Do we really believe this? This is hard because we've been taught to make it happen, to do it on our own. Even if God says, God gives us a vision of, man, there are people who are poor. We should go do something to help the poor. That could be a vision from God. And then we just all go, we just kind of go and say, okay, God, I got it from here. I'll let you know how it's going. Game on. And we go start using all the world's methods, the world's motives to go and try to do work for God. And it doesn't work that way. Oh, you can do stuff but you can't bear fruit. Fruit is supernatural. It has the fragrance of heaven. It bears the marks of the power of God. That's what fruit is. And it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. And for us, this is such a challenge because we really have been taught just to go roll up our sleeves and get it done. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Stop right there. What do I lean on if I don't lean on my own understanding? That is a challenging passage of scripture. I mean, we, we sing it all the time. I've, I know like three different songs that have that lyric in it. That's great. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It's easy for me to say right now. It's easy for me to put into a song lyric. But it's really hard to do. When my understanding is screaming at me, do that, do that, and every person in my life is joining in with it. Yes, do that, do that. The whole world, the media, leaders, everybody, do that, do that. And the Lord's saying, don't lean on your own understanding. Oh, God, why do I always have to be the weird one? You know, if you've ever followed Jesus, you felt that before. Why do I, why do I always have to be the nut job? You know, the whole world's going this way, and I'm supposed to, okay. I'm being facetious. Maybe in my 20s, I fe actually felt that way. I've been doing this long enough to know, whenever I do that, there's something waiting for me. It's called fruit. And it's beautiful. It's supernatural. And only Jesus can produce it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Okay, God, I get it. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Okay, instead of leaning on my own understanding, in all my ways, acknowledge him. Wait, even the regular stuff that kind of everybody knows how to do, right? Do I, do I, everything? In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your paths straight. Be, the, we we kind of stop there. Listen to verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Oh, is this so hard? Is this so hard for me? Because I kind of think I'm wise in my own eyes. And I got it. You know, I know how to do some things, God. And Jesus is, apart from me, you can do nothing fruitful. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be, listen to this. I love this. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Being wise in your own eyes might feed your ego a little bit, but it's really tiring. And it's really destructive to your soul. It's bad for relationships. And it doesn't bear fruit. Only Jesus can bear fruit. See, it's a different power. A different power source that comes through abiding in Jesus, that comes as a branch that is connected to the vine, because only he can produce fruit. Verse 8 tells us that fruit glorifies God. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Do you understand? Fruit causes people 
to, to believe in and praise God because of what they see in our life. You, you'll know it's fruit because it brings glory to God. It doesn't necessarily bring glory to me. Fruit is one of those things that make people go, man, what's going on? That's beyond just, okay, you're, you're a, a nice person, or that's beyond you're a, a productive person, or you're a hardworking person, okay? We've seen lots of that, and, that's, and those, are, those aren't bad. But fruit is something different. Fruit is something that Jesus said, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. He is given glory through the fruit that he produces in us and through us. Fruit causes people to believe in and praise God and glorify him. And interesting thing, fruit lasts. Fruit lasts. John 15, 16, he says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Another translation says remain. Another says it should last. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Fruit is lasting. It is eternal. It remains. That's the beauty of fruit. You can just see it. It has the sense of God's presence and his power and his life all over it. And remember, there's no such thing as a fruitful life without abiding in the presence of Jesus. Another thing Jesus said, second, I want you to, Write this down. Proof is the proof of discipleship. Proof, fruit is the proof of discipleship. A disciple is a person who has said, I'm going to follow Jesus. You know, we use all different kind of words. We use the word Christian. And it's become very popular to say, to, for people to abandon the word Christian because culturally that word has been dragged through the mud. I don't know how I feel about that. I understand it. I understand it. I totally get it. But it simply means Christ follower. Christ follower. That's what a disciple is, a person who has said, I've been forgiven and set free by Jesus. I'm filled with his spirit, and now I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus in my life, in my decisions, in my work, in my family, with my money, with everything that I do. My whole life, it's his, because I'm a disciple. Based on the same root as the word discipline. It's just that I have now taken his yoke upon me, so to speak, and I am Jesus, man. That's who I am. I'm his, and I'm going to follow Jesus. That's what a disciple is. And he said, fruit is the proof of a disciple. Remember, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You're like, that sounds kind of hard. Here's the thing. Remember, we can't produce fruit, right? We can only bear fruit. So it's not hard to produce fruit. It's not hard to prove to be his disciple. Just abide in him and let him bear fruit in you. That's how it works. Fruit is proof of discipleship. Paul in Philippians 1.11 talked about the fruit of righteousness that comes from Christ Jesus. That's what it is. Now, what kind of fruit? What does this fruit look like? Okay, well, Galatians 5. Remember what it tells you? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, internal fruit. God begins to work. When we are disciples of his, when we abide in the vine, he begins to do stuff inside of you. Do you, you have that habit or that thing, that reaction that you have that you just go, man, I hate it. I want to grow. I want to change. Do you know God is working? If you're a disciple of Jesus, he's working on that in you. And as we surrender to him, as we abide in him, as we spend time with him, connect with him, walk in him, live in him, do, do you understand that he's working on that thing, that temper, that thought life? that quick but hurtful tongue, whatever it is that, that you struggle with, that self-doubt, that shame, he is building fruit, and he's building the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know about you, that's good news. He is working on your character. He is working on your spirit. He is building, and listen to this, the character and nature of Jesus being built in us by the Holy Spirit who is bearing fruit in our lives. That's good stuff. So he bears fruit, internal fruit, inside of us. The fruit of obedience. One of the things he talks about in this passage is 
you will abide in my love if you obey my commandments. The fruit of obedience, one of the great fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruit that, that abiding in Jesus brings is obedience. I do what the Lord asks. And one of the big inhibitors in my growth, in my relationship, in my life in him, one of the things that stresses our relationship is disobedience. When I know the Lord has said, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to respond. Here's how I want you to spend that money. Here's what I want you to do in that relationship. Whatever it is, here's how I want you to, to raise your kids. Here's how I want you to invest your time. And we say, oh, God, yeah, but I want to do this instead. And we blow him off. We have just hindered the process of him bearing fruit in us and the fruit of obedience through us. And then the produce of your life, just what your life produces, he will bear a different kind of fruit. Remember when Jesus was talking about false teachers? And this is good because we got so many people, we all have the internet now, right? The disciples had to get false teachers as they came across them, okay? We don't. We could just do a nice search, false teacher, and they're all over. There's tons of them. Well, they don't usually identify themselves as such, but there's probably a few. But we can just search, and there's all this opinions and all this teaching and all this stuff that people say. Whatever crazy idea you want to say, you know, Jesus said this, you can find some goofball teacher out there to tell you Jesus said it. Completely devoid of the scripture. But they'll tell you. And if you're just wanting to hear that, that's, you're, you're prepared to stop there, okay. Well, you know, how do I know the difference, Jesus said? You'd know them by the fruit. You'd know, their by, you'd know them by the fruit. Well, wait a minute. I don't know their fruit. I don't know them at all. Oh, maybe you shouldn't take the word as gospel then. You ever thought about that? Yeah, but I like what they said. It matched what I want to think is true. They agree with me. They must be awesome. That's how ridiculous it is, but we do it all the time. We don't know them. That's, this is why community and being together in the fellowship matters because the people who are influencing, we know them. We know the fruit in their lives. We know their character. We know their family. We know how they handle their business. We know how they treat people. Those are the people I want to learn from. Not just someone who's good at turning a phrase or can speak well. I want to I learn from and be discipled by people that I know because I want to look at the fruit in their life. It's one of the things I went to conferences for years. And, man, there were great teachings, great books. I love leadership books. I love ministry books. But one of the things I find myself wanting to do is put the thing down and give them a call and just say, how did this actually work? Okay, tell me about it. Okay, what did your wife actually do when you said this? And what was the medical treatment? Because uh, there's things people just say, and it's just like, oh, okay. And I, I'm, I, I, automatically I get like a thousand questions. Well, how was it? What did your volunteers do? Or wait, wait, where did those people come from? Or well, how, what was the long-term ramification of that? I'm sure that worked cool in that one instance, but what about the whole year? What about the whole ministry? And see, what abiding in Jesus does is it produces supernatural fruit in us. It produces supernatural fruit of obedience through us. It produces in our life a fruit that has, again, the fragrance of heaven, the fingerprint of Jesus on it, because it is fruit that is produced by the vine and is born by the branches. And it's different. It's different. See, our lives should look different. We shouldn't just maybe be a nicer or more religious version of our unbelieving neighbors. There should be fruit that is just different, that makes people kind of scratch their heads and go, man. And then when they hear, they begin to glorify God because of what he's done, what he's done. All disciples bear fruit, and only disciples bear bear fruit. That doesn't mean other people can't do good things, great things, but fruit is supernatural. Let's not be confused here. We're not just talking about a nice life. It's like we're not talking about success. We're not talk, talk, talking, about, talking about being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Okay? We're talking about something supernatural that God wants to produce in the life of every believer. Fruit. Fruit is a supernatural product. See, I, I just want us really to pause and, and 
just grab this statement and wrestle with it. The life of a disciple should be marked by the power of God manifest in real fruit. It should change how you interact in your relationships. I'm not saying that you're perfect. I'm not saying you're floating on a cloud all the time and speaking in King James English. I'm just saying there's something different. There's something different about what God is doing in you. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Because even the Apostle Paul said, I haven't obtained it yet. All he went through, all he did, the miraculous, the scripture, all of it. And he says, not that I've already obtained it, but I'm pressing to take hold. fact is, there's no such thing as a fruitful life without abiding in the presence of Jesus. And last, I want to address just that. Third thing, we bear fruit by abiding in the vine. And the member pointed out a few minutes ago, the NIV says remain. Now, I want you to think of the implications of that. I remain in the vine. Do you know what that means? I'm attached at the hip. Like I pointed out at the beginning of the message, a vine it doesn't have to be told to stay connected to the, to, or a branch doesn't have to be told to stay connected to the vine. It just does. Doesn't have a choice. If I'm really abiding in Jesus, I'm the same way. I'm kind of, we're attached at the hip. And he's the vine. I'm just a branch. Branches can't just go where they think is best. They can't just get up and go, hey, I think I'm going to go do that. Or, oh, let's go do this. They can't just get a wild hair and go chase it. Because they are connected. They are remaining in the vine. And the branch must move when the vine moves. You realize there's a lot of great opportunities? There are a whole ki all kinds of great opportunities. And let, let me just tell you, if you've been around me at all, I love a good opportunity. Man, if there's a chance to, to take something that we think is important and move the ball down the field uh, you know, a little bit faster in a particular time, I, I love that. Do, do you realize I am not free just to grab the best opportunity that I think comes by? Not with this church not with my family, not with my kids, grandkids. I am not, pre because I am, I'm stuck with Jesus. I'm abiding in the vine. I get to go after the opportunities that Jesus says we're going to go after. And you know what? Those are the ones that are going to have supernatural fruit. I, we love telling the stories of the things that went cool. The story of how we got this property is really cool. The story of how God brought our, our Redland Road campus through the merger with Christ Redeemer Church, that's a really cool story. God did so many cool things. Do you know how many opportunities I went after that just ended up with, like, nothing? That I tried to chase down? I mean, I think I've grown in that, but there's a lot of things that, oh, that seems like a great opportunity. And you go and you check it out, and it's like, oh, nothing. It's, uh, okay. And the difference when you know that God has, is, the vine is saying, we're going to move over there. And it's like, really? He's like, you're a branch. Just come on. You're going to get to see some pretty cool fruit. I mean, are you willing? Stop and think about that. Do you believe that? Remember what we read from Proverbs? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. But God, that seems like a great opportunity. But God, that seems like the right way. God, we got to go do that. And the vine is saying, no, 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 be still. Be still right now, because I've got something else that I want us to do. And what I'm going to do is going to bear miraculous fruit in you, in your family, and in the people around you. A lot of great opportunities, but as branches in Jesus, we are abiding, we are remaining in the vine. I don't get to say, I get tired of you guys and this job. I don't get to say, well, I'm just going to get another job. I don't get to do that. And, and you want to know what's interesting? Neither do you. He's Lord over your work. He's Lord over where you go to church. Oh, that got real. <laughs> you don't, if, you're, if you're abiding in the vine, if you're a branch in the vine, we don't just get to say, yeah, I, I don't know. I know God brought me here, but, but I'm, I'm going to go check some other things out because I'm kind of tired of this. That is not how the branches work. We abide in the vine. Now, if the vine moves and says, I have something for you, well, 
And you go, but I love it here. I, don't, I, can't, I can't go, God. I love it here. No, I want to move you because I have an assignment for you. I have something I want you to do. Give your hugs, tell the fam you, you love them, and follow me. Okay, Jesus, because you're the vine, I'm not. Okay, real quickly, how do we abide? Okay, you sold me, Sean. We're supposed to abide. How do we do this? Let me reread a section of this, and actually add a verse. I'm going to read John 15, 7 through 12. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Anybody ever been bothered by that passage of scripture? <laughs> Jesus didn't stutter. Problem's not with Jesus. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let me give you some tips on abiding. Number one, daily communion in the word and prayer. Got to gotta meet with Jesus, listen to Jesus every day. The word. One video that we did get out on New Year's morning, I made a, just a simple video from my study on how to study the word and get started on an on a annual reading plan. If you're not on a reading plan of just scripture, just taking in the word of God. Everything I've said about Jesus is not, is not true just because I think it's cool and I want to say it. It's from the word of God. This is how we know what we know about Jesus. We believe this is God's word given to us. We believe his spirit speaks to us. We believe his spirit leads us. But it all flows from and stems from right here. I know to listen for the Holy Spirit because the scripture told me the Holy Spirit's going to speak to me. That's how I know. Those are not contradictory items. They are the same. And God gave his word. So get in the word. On our YouTube, our, go to River City's YouTube page. You can find that, how to read the, the Bible. And I give you a simple reading plan that we use. You can go to version and get a different reading plan. Be in the word every day. Word and prayer. Talk to Jesus. Okay? Talk to Jesus. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. How are his words going to abide in me? I'm going to spend time and I'm going to listen to him in the word, and in prayer. Second thing that he highlights is obedience. Here's one of the greatest things I learned about abiding, because I went through this process of wondering, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? 1 John 2, 5 and 6 says this, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Verse 6, whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I abide in Jesus by walking the way Jesus did and obeying him, the Father, his spirit in me. Obedience. Another way to abide is to abide in community. He left them with this commandment. He says that you love one another. So much happens because of the community. Oh, I don't need the community. See right there what you just did? You stopped abiding. Because he says you need the community. Well, but I, I, don't need, I don't need the church. I'm closer to God out in nature. Okay, be close to God in nature. That's a gift from him, by the way. That's awesome. I feel God's presence when I get to worship and play music and worship with the body of Christ. I feel his presence. That doesn't mean I don't need to be in community. The vine, through his word, has said, something happens when I'm in community. His presence manifests. Other people encourage me. Other people sharpen me. I learn how to operate as his spirit leads me in community. There are three commands, really, in John 15 and 16 that are very powerful, pointed. Abide in him love each other, and then later on in 16, he tells, testify. And they're all empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, it's all about abiding. Him and us, us in him. And what I want us to, to 
two for this year, okay? Next week, we're actually going to go, we're going to go to Colossians, and we're going to start talking about being gospel people. We're going to learn what Paul taught about this life of ours, and it's powerful stuff. But man, I don't care what you're learning if you're not abiding in the vine. It can all be, it can all be head knowledge. It can all be stuff that we fill our heads with. I want to encourage us to rest in him. Abide in him. Listen to him. Live in him. Because that's where the supernatural power comes from. You ever look at the scriptures and just go, man, the power of God is so relevant. What's happening in our lives? Why don't we see that? Well, are we abiding in him? So he says, if you do, you will bear much fruit. You'll glorify my father. You'll experience his presence. Isaiah chapter 40. Very simple, beautiful Old Testament passage. Isaiah writes, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Those who wait, those who hope, those who abide in the Lord. But wait a minute, running and, and walking, and isn't that what I'm supposed to do? That, that sounds like action. That sounds like movement. That sounds like doing for God. Actually not. It comes for those who wait on the Lord because they mount up with wings as eagles. It's, it's not about doing in my strength. It's not about, it's not about what I can do for him. It's truly about letting the Lord shape me from the inside out. Letting him produce supernatural fruit. And man, I just want to encourage you, don't settle for anything less. Let's just worship the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will run, not be weary. They will walk, will not faint. I will wait on you, Lord. Let me rise up with a wind like an eagle as I wait on you, Lord. Please renew my strength. No other the name of the Lord can give water to thirsty ground. No other voice but the voice of heaven inspires peace with just its sound. Let me rise up with a wing like an eagle oh, as I wait on you, Lord. Please renew my strength. Lord Jesus, let us wait on you. Let us rest in you. I pray that this year, Lord, we would seek you and you alone. Teach us to abide in you. Teach us to wait on you, to trust you more than our own understanding. Oh, I will wait on you, Lord. Let me rise up with wings like a I wait on you, Lord. Please renew my strength. 
as I wait on you, Lord. Please endure my strength. Just take a moment with Jesus. And I exalt thee. There's no other name. Lord, there's no other like you. Lord, there's no other one who could satisfy, fill my heart. I exalt. Lord, in this place, we exalt you. In our hearts, we exalt you. I just ask Jesus that tomorrow, Tuesday, next week, next month, we will continue to exalt you by abiding in you, remaining in you. Lord, your desire is to bear supernatural fruit in every life here, and I pray that we would cooperate rather than fighting you. We love you and we worship you, Jesus. Be lifted up in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.